Well, the only Greek temples that show up on the College Board list are the Parthenon and the Temple of Athena Nike. Once again, I'm reluctant to move right into what is probably the apogee or high point of Greek architecture without a little preview about how the Greeks got there. But first, let's stand back for a moment and think about Greek temples as a sacred space. You've seen this slide before, and I was pleased that several of you used these points in your presentations. Unlike Egyptian mortuary temples or Sumerian ziggurat temples, the Greek temple was very much a public venue, but the main gathering place where sacrifices and rituals were performed was still outside the temple. Inside was where the god, or rather the cult statue, resided. We often refer to churches as houses of God, but really, of course, they're houses where people gather to worship God. In Greek culture, the temple was seen as the god's house. Certainly, enormous wealth was spent on temples, especially the Parthenon, not only to honor the gods, but maybe even more to honor the accomplishments of the Greeks. A classic example would be the now destroyed and huge statue of Athena in the Parthenon, a statue of gold and ivory that may have cost as much to make as the entire temple cost to build, and we are talking about several billion dollars in current money. Enormous wealth was also stored in temples. Uh, votive offerings were placed there. I've referred to ritual and ceremony already and to the rather odd fact that these rituals and ceremonies took place outside the temple. As for location, Greek temples were almost always placed on a hill or a citadel. The term polis initially referred to the citadel. So, the whole temple is built on a stylobate or platform. I've never seen that term on an AP test, but it could show up now, and actually it's pretty important. Remember, those are the ones that are curved slightly in the middle to give the illusion, or, or sort of humped up to give the illusion of flatness. The central hall that houses the cult statue is the cella, and that's a term you should know by now. The external colonnade is the peristyle. In this case, the colonnade or peristyle is peripteral. You're going to see that word in a minute. That means it has a single row of columns. A dipteral peristyle has a double row of columns. We'll see when we get to the Parthenon that it is dipteral. Okay, you have a copy of this squirrely diagram or one very much like it in your study guides. Now, I hope labeled. I'm not going to repeat what I said on the study guide. Greek architecture, alas, requires a certain amount of memorization, and I tried to guide you toward the must-know terms. You should be prepared to see those terms on tomorrow's quiz, probably in matching form, which will cover the readings for this lesson and the next one, by the way. So here you see the capitals again. Doric columns usually do not have a base, and their capitals are very simple. Ionic columns have those scrolls, which are called volutes. Corinthian columns are topped with acanthus leaves. The Temple of Hera I is one of the oldest stone Doric temples, constructed in the Archaic period before Greek architects had quite figured out the whole temple thing. There was a functional problem. Any guess what it was? Well, worshippers couldn't get a clear view of the interior and the votive statue. Indeed, because of the internal columns, there wasn't an obvious place to put the cult statue. They'll figure out how to fix this. They'll also realize that the columns don't have to be this thick to hold up the roof. But note that even this early, the Greeks have figured out antasis, the swelling uh, at the center that gives the illusion of straightness. This temple represents a transition between archaic and, and classical temples. It's still Doric, but what differences do you observe? The interior space has opened up, which will give the citizens a better view of the votive statue in the cella. The columns are more widely spaced and more slender. Okay, now we're going to play Guess the Order. As I was reading up on Greek temples, I found a website that featured the top 10 temples. I don't think that's an official designation, and I decided to spare you all 10. This one is the largest temple in Athens, Agora, however, so it's not impossible you would need to identify it. What order? It's a little hard to see the capitals, but you should recognize the triglyphs and metopes. This is a Doric peripteral temple. And what is peripteral again? A single row of columns in the peristyle. The date should be a dead giveaway, as should the short, squat, heavy appearance, at least by Greek temple standards. This is an early Doric temple. 
Uh, I visited this temple in May 2013. It may have the most beautiful setting of any Greek temple that I've seen, and I've seen a lot of them. I'll tell you that this is Doric. You tell Ms. Jacobs why that's confusing. Yes, Doric columns do sometimes have bases, although these are very simple. The triglyphs and metopes, as well as the lack of volute, still give this one away. If the AP exam asks about the order that has no base to the columns, it's asking about Doric. This temple is part of the Acropolis and is most famous for its caryatid porch, which you see off to the left. Caryatids are female figures that are used as columns. But... What do you see in the front? What order is this? Ah, at last we have an Ionic temple. Note the volutes and the taller, more slender form. Now the caryatid porch of the Erechtheion has long been an AP favorite, but it's not included in the new image list. It's possible, though, that you might be asked to know the term caryatid, which again is a female statue serving as a column. And yes, there are male statues, as, uh, col statue columns as well, called Atlantids. Uh, here we see Atlantid groupings from pre-Columbian Mexico in the upper left and from an Egyptian temple on the lower right. Okay, finally, we get to one of the required works. So which order do you see? Again, this is an Ionic temple. If you're wondering what happened to the Corinthian order, it's going to show up much more in Roman architecture. The Romans liked this more ornate style. It's actually a very late development in Greek architecture. So what besides the volutes tell you that this is an Ionic temple? And this is kind of tricky, but it's important when we get to the Parthenon. Well, here we see two entablatures. The entablature is the space between the capitals of the column and that triangular pediment. That's the gable under the roof. Doric temples, again, are decorated with alternating bands of triglyphs. That's those three vertical stripes, which are thought to imitate the wood of original Greek temples. And metopes, and that's the re rectangular spaces between the triglyphs that are decorated with relief sculpture. Ionic temples abandon this pattern for a continuous frieze. The friezes of the Temple of Athena Nike, most of which have been removed to museums, depict battles between Greeks and Persians, as well as the usual processions of gods and goddesses. The image on the bottom right from the south frieze is thought to portray the Battle of Marathon. The Temple of Athena Nike is located at the entranceway to the Acropolis, right next to the Propylaea, or gate. This had been an important sanctuary site back to the Mycenaean era. The site is protruding tall mass of rock, strategically located in a way that protects the south flank of the most vulnerable access point and gate to the citadel. Early in its history, it was a place of worship for deities associated with wars, perhaps Bronze Age Nike gods or goddesses, which with time fused with the cult of Athena Nike of later centuries. The small archaic temple that had stood there was destroyed by the Persians, as was the unfinished temple of Athena that was replaced by the Parthenon. And it too was rebuilt as part of Pericles' big public works program in 435 BCE, the one that helped bring on the Peloponnesian Wars. Callicrates, one of the architects of the Parthenon, was the architect of this building. The cella of the temple housed a wooden cult statue of the goddess who held a helmet in one hand, a symbol of war, and a branch of pomegranate tree in the other symbol of peace. Usually Athena's uh, symbol is the olive. Notice that she represents both war and peace, uh, agriculture and plenty, and the ability to defend that. That's very typical of the Athenians uh, to view both sides of their character is important. So this gives you a better sense of the temple's prominent and precarious setting, and maybe some idea why the Athenians decided to add a parapet wall. I'm going to postpone my discussion of the famous frieze of Athena adjusting her sandal until my next lecture, when I'll complete this classical work with a Hellenistic statue. Oh, excuse me, I'll compare that classical work with a Hellenistic statue of Nike. For now, let's stick with architecture and on to the Parthenon. Not surprisingly, this was number one on the list of must-see 10 temples. The Parthenon actually has both Doric and Ionic elements. But what is most visible here? If you were just to see this, would you say this is a Doric or an Ionic temple? 
it's clearly Doric. These are not the heavy Doric columns of 100 years earlier, but still there's no base to the columns. There are no scrolled volutes. We see an architrave featuring triglyphs, excuse me, an entablature featuring triglyphs and metopes, not a continuous frieze to be complicated. The architrave is part of the entablature, more complicated than you need to get. At any rate, this is Doric. But, and this is where it gets complicated, the inner colonnade, remember this is a dipteral uh, colonnade, double row of columns. It's decorated with a continuous frieze, and the continuous frieze is an ionic feature. There aren't any volutes in the inner colonnade. There may have been some uh, on a back porch, which has since been blown up, uh, but the continuous frieze is still considered an ionic feature. So if the question is whether the Parthenon is Doric or ionic, it's mostly Doric, but it does have ionic features. You could very easily get that question. So the plaque of the Ergustines, which was part of the Panathenaic procession, is one of these ionic continuous friezes. Here are a couple more, just to get a sense of what they look like. For the rest of the day, I plan to focus on the Parthenon. There is a really good Nova documentary called Secrets of the Parthenon, and I hope you'll have time to see at least some of it in class, and I think Ms. Jacobs has scheduled an extra credit lunch session to watch more of it. I'm actually hoping to show up for that and bring cookies. Let's begin with the introduction, which gives you some good visuals of the Parthenon and a glimpse of just how influential this building has been in the history of architecture. Well, that parade of Panthea of Parthenon wannabes should persuade you that this is an important building. So now let's turn to another clip from the video, which talks first about the history of the Parthenon's construction, and then in a later slide about the science of optical illusion that its design seems to embody. You've learned some about that before, so I'm hoping a lot of that's review. If you're wondering why I'm taking so much of our precious and limited time for a video, it's because I thought this was an especially good introduction to optical illusion. We've talked before about the challenge of representing a three-dimensional object on a flat surface, and now we're exploring the challenge of making buildings appear straight when our eye naturally sees curves. And we're going to talk more throughout this course about artists' use of illusion, sometimes in this case to imitate nature. Here you see the Parthenon as it, uh, as a model of its original appearance, including the cult statue. Note that there are eight columns in front and 17 on the long side. Again, the next section of the video does a good job of explaining some of the mathematical proportions used to construct the building and indicates that there's still some controversy about the mathematical theories surrounding its beauty. By the way, they make reference to a frieze that was found that's a statue of an arm that the scholars think was actually used uh, to guide the, the construction workers and the architects in measuring uh, for the Parthenon. At any rate, note that Donald Duck is no longer considered the absolute authority on the mathematics of the Parthenon. So here you see the Parthenon's floor plan. Note that the central place in the cella where the famous Athena Parthenos, Athena the Virgin, stood. The frieze on the inside wall of one long side contained the Panathenaic procession. Outside on the same side, the Metopes portrayed a centauromachy, that is a fight between centaurs and lapiths, who were kind of stand-ins for the Athenians. We'll see more of the friezes in the next lecture. The procession continues on the other long inside wall, while the outside Metopes tell the narrative of the Sack of Troy. Friezes at either end show fights with Amazons and giants, more Machis, while on one side the pediment sculptures depict the famous contest between Poseidon and Athena to gain the role as patron saints of Athens. The other side shows the birth of Athena. How like the Athenians to have the gods fighting over the honor of being associated with them. And here you see the Parthenon as it looks now uh, with the diagrams from the video of the Enstasis. I hope you do have a chance to watch more of this video in our next class. We will finish up our study of Greek sculpture and then move on to Rome.